Broadcasting live from the Business Radio X studios in Atlanta, Georgia, it's time for Atlanta Business Radio, spotlighting the city's best businesses and the people who lead them. Lee Cantor here with Sanjay Torre, another episode of Atlanta Business Radio, and it's going to be a fun one. Yeah, exactly. Got some old friends, some new friends, and a lot of people doing amazing things here in Atlanta. Yep. All right, let's kick it off with Lonnie and Karen Mims. They are with the Computer Museum of America. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Well, tell us a little bit about Computer Museum of America. Um, what's happening over there? Well, we are going to be having our grand opening on July the 20th, this coming Saturday, which happens to correspond with the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And is that a coincidence or uh, no, it's you did not. that? You it's waited not. all these years to, for this 50th anniversary and said, now we can do this. Yeah. We've been uh, actually uh, <laughs> rushing to put everything together, but uh, I think, I think you'll be uh, very pleasantly surprised. We actually have one of our major exhibits that is oriented to uh, the landing. Uh, related to the uh, moon landing. Yes. Uh huh. And so that's the tie in. Was that, Oh, um, how did you get, Uh, this collection going? How did that come about? Well, it actually started uh, almost 40 years ago when I was a child and took a class at Fernbank that just got me hooked in computer programming. And shortly after that, uh, the family business, uh, which is a local real estate company, I'm third generation, um, bought a computer, a a microcomputer, what year was this? That probably was about 1977. So um, computers are, weren't what they are today where they sit on a desk? Not at in all. In the 70s. What do they look like in the 70s? Um, typically, you know, the one I had was one of the first ones that actually had the keyboard incorporated into the computer. Mm-hmm. And then you had a small black and white monitor that sat on top. And if you were really lucky... Uh, you would have a floppy, early floppy drive with it, although Mm -hmm. most of the early ones had a cassette player as the storage uh, methodology. And then when you say storage, how much storage would fit in one of those devices? Well, the the one I had was was absolutely unbelievable because it held about 360K. 360K. Which is (laughs) 360,000 bytes. And then, like, if in terms of like words, how many words would that be about? Or well, like, what's you, a unit of measurement that people can understand? Well, each byte would be a letter, let's say. Uh huh. So a word, I guess, in typing class was always five letters. So you can you can do the math. I mean, it wouldn't it wouldn't fit a you know a, a book wouldn't a, fit a, in a there. huge yeah it wouldn't fit a, a large document for sure. Mm-hmm. And then how did you use this kind of early computing? How did you, your company use it? Well, at that point, there, there wasn't any, any killer apps. The, the spreadsheet had not been invented yet. It didn't come out till 79. So pretty much I had to write whatever, whatever programs we needed for amateurization of loans, for analyzing properties, things like that. So it was a kind of a do-it-yourself thing. There weren't pre produced kind of software for you to use you were kind of had a blank slate based on your skills exactly exactly it was very much a a hobbyist um, industry if you will that that sort of spun off from ham radios as much as anything really so it was people enjoyed that kind of hobbyist ham radio talking to anybody in the world that kind of opened their mind to maybe there's a way to do this through typing. Yeah. That was one of the, one of the first uses Mm -hmm. and those were very, a very technical group. So some of the first ads for the early, early computers were in the ham radio magazines. Mm -hmm. And then about mid 70s, 74, 75 is when you started seeing dedicated magazines for computer hobbyists but it was very much a do-it-yourself put together the machines and you, and you had so you to had have to build, some understanding you, you were getting components and you had to kind of build the machine well there were there were kits and mm-hmm. there were in in magazines like radio electronics and popular electronics there were um, kits and plans for for building these actually the machine that i had uh, in the very beginning started out as a kit advertised in one of those one of those uh, electronics magazines it was the Sol 20 that Sol S A L S O L S O L 
and I think it was it was from Processor Technology, which is a, a company that spun off from making memory cards for one of the very first microcomputers. Mm -hmm. But I think it was named after the editor of the magazine, which was uh, Solomonson. Mm -hmm. And then so what compelled your family to say, hey, this is something we should invest in? Because I bet back then that wasn't uh, an inexpensive thing, was it? it? Was, yeah, it was very expensive, for, especially for what it did or right. uh, you know, for, the, for the unknown factor <laughs> of what it might do is a, probably a better way to put it. Um, so, I mean, honestly, it was just because my father saw that I had such a passion for, for this thing, this right. new thing. He didn't really understand it. Sure. So it was as much buying it um, to support my passion, You're, I think, as it was. He, he probably was surprised when there was actually some, some useful information <laughs> coming out of it. So it was like, a, like your hobby. This was like, like if my kid wanted to play golf, I would buy him golf clubs. and Exactly. Right, so it wasn't like he saw some business use. Oh, we'll be able to do something for this, and you're the one who kind of took this blank sheet of paper and said, "Okay, maybe you can do this with this." Exactly, and and what's interesting is I don't know how many years, but for the first so many years of the hobby, it it was a challenge to find something to use a computer for. People were groping for things to do with it. There was no killer app. They didn't even use the name app. They were programs. Mm -hmm. So they would use them for things like uh, recipes. I mean, as, as ridiculous as that sounds, you could scale a recipe on a computer. I mean, that's how that that's how uh, you know slow it was in the beginning. Is figuring out what do you do with this? But there was basic languages, right? That you had to learn to code to make the machine do anything. It wasn't like an intuitive, you know, fill in this blank. Everything was kind of blank sheets of paper, but it could do certain things. Absolutely. Right. And you had to learn that? Yes. From this is the earliest time, right? Of Were well, there programs, you know, kind of basic understanding of programs before this? Or like what stage are we at in the evolution of computing at this point? No, pro programming started, I guess, uh, you know, theoretically in the, in the early to mid-1800s with Charles Babbage. And in, in most publications, Ada Lovelace, who, who was associated with Charles Babbage, is given credit as the first programmer. So the first programmer was actually was a, a lady. Woman. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's so, awesome. And, and what, was the, what was the program and what was the machine that it was doing? Well, back, back then, they never, they never had enough accurate milling machines to create the technology, although his designs have been, have been made uh, recently, and they ap actually work perfectly. Mm -hmm. But it was a mechanical device with lots of gears, and the purpose was to do calculations, repetitive calculations, because the tables for, for various math functions at the time had lots of inaccuracies in it, and that really bothered Charles Babbage. Right. So he devised a machine with the help of this woman? Well, he, he came up with the machine pretty much on his own, uh -huh. but she's the one that introduced the, the, the real idea of, of changing what it could do and, and you know, creating what we would call a program today. Mm -hmm. And then, so then what happened with that? Was he, it in use or did somebody use it? No, he, he made a small version of it that's at the uh, Museum of Science in London right now. But he, he was always soliciting in front of uh, the government to try to get funding for this device. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, he spent years and years soliciting for money. And it never, it never came to fruition during his lifetime. So that still happens today in different forms, right? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> so not, not much has changed in that regard. So then from there, it, it became less mechanical and more where there's computing power behind it. At what point did that occur? It, it evolved. There was a, a huge accelerator. Um, well, really two things. The first one was the, the Second World War. So whenever, whenever there was a need for code breaking... Um, you know, specifically with the Enigma machine. If you've mm -hmm. seen, if you've seen the uh, the movie Imitation Game mm -hmm. um, on Alan, uh, really focused on Alan Turing's uh, career, right? Uh, that shows you a little bit of background in what they were doing to try to break the German code. So, code was important in the military to just have secrets amongst themselves and protect that information. Yeah. And the other the other thing it was used for during Second World War was that. 
they needed to have charts and tables for ballistics for being able to to fire artillery shells and with with different variables they and that was world war ii that was when the industrialization of war began yes well i, I guess you could say that began in world war one but the computing side really but this really did it at scale world in world war ii Right yes. before in World War One, it was more I'm shooting you in front of you, and now we're sending missiles and doing things that require more kind of data and calculation. Right, and then because of that, there had to be more kind of programs and computing power, I guess. Even the, the I don't know what words they used to describe that, but yeah. So the first the first real digital computer, I guess, could be attributed to um, you know being created because of World War Two. Uh, the ENIAC was a machine that was designed to do calculations and come up with these tables for their, the artillery shells. So they're shooting a missile, and at first they were just shooting in to an, just a general area. They When did they start getting kind of where they can aim it a little bit? And I guess they would shoot, have a spotter, something, and then adjust. You know. As they go, like go left. Yeah, the, the other the other thing that came out during that time was trying trying to get more accurate bombing. Mm-hmm. So they came up with the Norden bomb site, which is which is a was a top secret computer that that was on board uh, the bombers for the for the Allies, and we actually have a Norden bomb site on display at in, the museum. In phase one at the museum. Wow. And then what what did that entail? Was there still spotters on the ground that like sent up a flare or something, and they aimed it at that? Like how did they? No, they would they would align the target with uh, looking through the lenses on this computing device, which was very very much analog, and then the computer would actually take over the flying of the airplane for a short time while the bombs were dropped. And although it was nothing compared to what we can do today, not even close, it it did greatly improve the accuracy mm-hmm. from previous to that. And then after World War II, when was the next leap? Um, uh, well, another great accelerator, which ties into the, the whole space program, um, was the space race. And that was a, uh, another huge accelerator with integration of circuits and, uh, you know, the idea of taking any kind of computer and being able to launch it because computers at that, during that era were like IBM 360s, they would fill entire rooms. Mm-hmm. So you can't, put that on a spacecraft and take it right. to the moon. Anywhere. You won't get very far. Right. You, 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 you know, you can't even fit most of it on a truck. So, you, you know, you wouldn't get off the pad. So they had to figure out how to miniaturize uh, these computing devices, even though by today's standards they were very primitive, um, they were still obviously enough to get to the moon. And then the space race, that started with this kind of missiles, right, where at some point they said, hey, can we aim the missile straight up? to space well again that ties into you know during during world war ii the germans were were very far ahead of of the allies in in the missile area Mm -hmm. and they sent thousands of v2 rockets uh, i guess mainly over to england and after the war there was a, a little bit of a scramble to to get as many german scientists as we could and i think it was called operation paperclip and the Russians were doing the same, same thing. thing. So Werner von Braun was was really the head of the uh, the, the German uh, space program, or the, the German missile program was more accurate. And he came over to be uh, the lead in NASA for designing and getting the rocket to go to the moon. And then that was ha- happening, and simultaneously in Russia, there was, they were doing Sputnik, and they were doing their own thing, and it was kind of... Who's winning? Yeah, they right? very, very they much trying... started uh, started ahead of us, mm-hmm. and uh, I wasn't around at that time. <laughs> but apparently, it was a it, it was a very scary thing. The idea that a foreign power had this thing flying around the globe that was beeping <laughs> constantly, and that you know, what does that mean? What right. you know, where where can they take that? And then so it was kind of Russia and America are trying to one-up each other in terms of who can do different things in space. Yeah, I think it. I think initially it, it probably was, was that way. And then whenever John Kennedy actually gave the, the, the goal, 
Right. We're going to put a person on the moon. Yeah. By the end a of, man on the moon and returning him safely to Earth. Before the end of the decade. Yes. Yes. That, that so he really put a stake in the, the ground. He's right. So he and then at that time, how where was it? That was kind of a, a more aspirational than it was. He had really something in his pocket that he could pull this off. Right. I'm I'm sure he shocked a lot of a lot <laughs> scientists. of scientists at that point in time. <laughs> Absolutely. So then, but it put a stake in the ground and said, "Look, we got to do this." Yes. And then we all rallied, and then you have some of the computing power that helped make that happen. Like, what's at the museum in regards to this? In the in the space area, we have we have a um, a model, a very large model of the lunar lander of the LEM. Um, it is sitting on a moon floor that you can walk on, and it's in front of the the classic Earthrise mural, uh, probably the largest one that's been printed from the actual Apollo 8 Earthrise photo, which was the first photo of the Earth from a manned mission. So this is a good uh, photo op for the... People are going to the museum. Oh, we have an incredible <laughs> selfie station, com- complete, complete with a uh, with a fiberglass astronaut that's dressed up like uh, like Neil Armstrong. So now, um, what are the other things that you have? So you, the space is a is kind of that was a um, a stake in the ground for you to to get this all going by the fiftieth anniversary. Yes. So space obviously holds a great kind of part to your heart in it's, this it's uh, along with collecting the computers um space was always an interest of mine and i actually had a mural in my bedroom that was very similar mm-hmm. uh, of the earth rise you know from the moon that you could you could get back in the 70s and that was on on the wall in my bedroom and um, i actually wrote a letter to uh, neil armstrong in 69 when i was a child and that's on display as well. He replied. Yeah, it was a standard thing from NASA that you'd get you'd get their their standard picture of them right. in the uniform. He, he said, uh, "Best wishes, Lonnie Neil Armstrong." Mm-hmm. And then, uh, so now you decide at some point, I'm gonna. I've been collecting uh, all this stuff, and I'm like, and then Karen, you said. Why don't we get it out of the house and put it in? Like, how, did, how did that? I, all right, so just so you know, he did not qualify for the hoarder show. They, they did ask, but <laughs> no. So, I mean, the collection that he has. So when we first met and I started hearing about the collection, you know, I thought, okay, yeah, he's got some computers. And then when I saw them, I, I just couldn't believe it. Just blown away at really the, the breadth and depth and, you know, Thank goodness he's in real estate because it's not in the house. That that <laughs> really is, is not an option. Um, but you know, as a former educator myself, I truly see the impact that the mm-hmm. museum is going to have. And we have a daughter that's interested in STEM as well. And and that's another big you know mission of ours is to get more women interested in STEAM. And you have to start early. Right. You have to start you know young. But um, when you walk through the museum. And just see the history and where we've been. And, and a big part of this is that things were thrown away, you know, recycled. You know, we're in that society today where right. everything's it's, disposable. It's meant to only last a couple of years and you upgrade and get right. rid of the previous right. thing. So for crazy collectors <laughs> like my So husband. we're calling it collectors. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's the politically correct exactly. term for this. Yes. Okay, collectors. Yes. Collector. I'll tell that um, to my wife. Well, that I'm a collector too. You know, in any collector, it's not just one item. He collects coins, big <laughs> numismatics, you know. Even That'll has, be a future uh, museum or you've somehow incorporated well, that. Actually, we have we have one of the of the actual um Robin's medallions that went to the moon on Apollo 11 on display as well. And this one belonged to Collins, who was the commander flying around above the moon in orbit while while Buzz and Neil went to the surface. He never got to the surface? He never got to the surface, but there were were so many jokes, I guess, amongst the astronauts uh, afterwards that, that one of them painted a picture called the fantasy shot. And it shows, it shows all three of them on the surface with um, with uh, Collins in the middle, and uh, you know somebody doing the bird above his head and, and and things like that, and we actually have a a diorama of that as well in the museum. There's many dioramas to show different scenes 
of events that took place during each of the six um, moon landings. Now, for this big grand opening event, are there kind of uh, people, uh, like I, I know I saw Penny Collins wrote about this on LinkedIn, that there was an astronaut at the... Yes, so um, so last night, or Saturday night, was our Celebrate the Launch, right. which was our inaugural fundraiser for the museum, and Dr. Sandy Magnus, a female astronaut that received her doctorate at Georgia Tech, was our um, speaker, and then um, Tim Copra... I'm an astronaut as well, was was there in attendance. So she sort of kicked off um, our celebration, and it was phenomenal. We were had the opportunity to meet her last fall at Georgia Tech and hear her speak, mm-hmm. and everything she said was in direct alignment with what we're trying to do with the museum. Right. And so when we shared with her what we were trying to do, she just was really thrilled and excited. But when she came out to see it, Again, what everyone continues to say is, wow, I had no idea. They all think they're coming out to Roswell to see a little house (laughs) with a few items. And when they come to, you know, phase one is, you know, 40, 44,000 square feet of space. You know, 10,000 of that is an event space that's, you know, (coughs) that um, corporations or individuals can, can rent out and use. But. You know, we have three main exhibits, Um, and you can tell them a little bit about that, but, you know, the history of computing, because that's important, you know, to do the timeline, Um, the Apollo 11, and then supercomputing. So, and that's part of the reason we're on the first floor Mm -hmm. is because one of the, one item is 26,000 pounds, equivalent of 13 elephants. (laughs) So we couldn't find an engineer that would let us go upstairs. <laughs> so that's phase two. So we have a lot of room for growth. You know, the great thing is, is that there isn't an industry that hasn't been touched by technology. Right. So the opportunities really are endless to create these exhibits that tell stories and to educate and inspire. Now, you mentioned the importance of women in the history of <sighs> computing. Um, what are some of the activities you're doing other than you're bringing a female astronaut? Obviously, that's important to show them what this could be for them and to stick with it. Um, you know, we do a lot of work with women in technology here. And one of the challenges at some point, girls and boys are playing with computers and interested in math and science. But at some point, the kind of the road forks mm-hmm. and girls aren't kind of pursuing it. Is there st- activities you're doing to help kind of encourage girls and women to, st- to stick with it? Right. Well, at the beginning, you know, we will only be open in, on the weekends, so mm-hmm. Saturday and Sunday. But we are partnering with different companies. The first one that we're working with is Kids for Coding. Mm-hmm. So they are coming in on Saturdays in the fall, and they will offer classes that you can, you know, register and become a part of. But we want to we house classes, programs, speaking engagements that directly align with our mission and what we're trying to do. And then as we ramp up and as we grow and get support from from the community, corporations, and individuals, we'll have more of an opportunity to create our own programming that directly align with, with our missions. But that, right now there's so many other people that are doing these things. So right. if we can You work just want with a partner them, to, sh- to give them resources to help them better do what they're trying to do. Exactly. Now, uh, for you, what is the overarching mission of this? What's your vision? Well, the, the, the core is the preservation of technology that is, is passing by so quickly right. at an accelerating pace. So that's the core. Because that's a double-edged sword. The, as fast as technology kind of is improving our lives, we're kind of forgetting the stuff that w- came before it, the foundational things. Exactly. And because it's happening so quickly... Um, it, it, it's, it, it hit me uh, a while back that, that these things aren't being saved because they're not old enough to go into the traditional museums. Mm-hmm. I mean, to the degree where um, the Apple one at the Smithsonian came from my collection um, because nobody was preserving them at the time it was happening. Um, so, you know, it's just a blink of an eye since this whole industry started. So that's the core, but then beyond that, we want to be able to use these these items to inspire people. Our tagline is "Innovation Passed Forward." Uh, there there are very few things that did not evolve from a prior invention, and in a lot of cases, 
it's a it's kind of a reawakening. It's a, it's a it's a realization that something that somebody came up with twenty five or thirty years ago was just ahead of its time. It didn't have the technology infrastructure to make it work. Um, you know, uh, one example of that might be like the Apple Newton. It was a it was a PDA. It was a pocket device that was meant to keep your calendar, take notes, do things like that. But there wasn't the infrastructure in the 80s to be able to make it a truly useful device. But clearly, you know, what we use our phones for today has that aspect built into it. Right. And then part of that is because the computing power keeps getting faster, cheaper, where it's able to do more and more things. Like to give right. people some understanding, your phone that you have, everybody has, even even a basic version of it is more computing power than they had, what, 30 years ago, 20 years ago? Well, it's definitely more computing power than what was on the, the uh, Apollo lander. Right. <laughs> so now, and that would fill a room. Yes, right? they were they were using a lot of room filling computers uh, back in Houston, so it wasn't like the whole mission was being driven by a calculator. But nonetheless, you know, even those rooms full of computers um, have been supplanted by the technology in your pocket. And that it's, I guess, it's hard for young people to kind of fathom that. And this gives them a chance to walk into a room and see what was, and that their phone is kind of more powerful than that room. Right. And the other side of it with our supercomputing exhibit is that we're showing machines that are still orders of magnitude faster than your phone. And the the amount of calculations that some of these machines can do is is really not comprehensible by humans. When you start adding 12 zeros behind a number, um, it, it really loses its meaning. And then are we still at a, a pace where the computing power is kind of doubling every 18 months or so? I think that that has been tweaked. Um, you're talking about Moore's Law, and that's been tweaked a little bit here and there, but, but up, approximately yes. So with that being the case, every 18 months, and where it's incalculable now to our human brain, what's happening 18 months from now or 18 months from then? Exactly. Well, our, our, the, the title of our supercomputing exhibit is Vanquishing the Impossible mm-hmm. with the, the idea that, that things that could not be done, it just wasn't human, you know, it wasn't possible, um, are, now, are now being able to be accomplished. You know, whether it's weather forecasting and, um, you know, predicting where things are going, you, you need to be able to do a lot of calculations per second uh, to be able to do it in anything close to real time for significance. It doesn't help if you do a weather forecast and it takes you three days to do the weather forecast for tomorrow. Right. So, the, And then when you look into a room, uh, how big is a supercomputer? Well, the machines themselves are probably, um, you know, the biggest, the biggest single machine we have is maybe eight feet long, uh, six feet wide, and about five feet tall. And that's, then, but at some point, that's going to be powerful. Where it'll be your phone, probably yes. Right. That historically, that's been the case. Right. Yes. So why would there be a reason for it not to be the case? Well, we're we are reaching some some uh, limits in physics, but there's other other areas of computing that are that are starting. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it's biological or whether it's quantum. Um, so I have I have. Uh, great hopes that it will continue and then if somebody wanted to go and check out the museum what's the you know coordinates we are located at the intersection of alfreda highway and holcomb bridge road just a little bit off of 400 north of atlanta and we're in the shopping center that is called roswell town center there's a chick-fil-a on the corner and aurora theater is on the back side um, where the entrance to the museum is for Phase 1, and that's 5000 Commerce Parkway, Roswell, Georgia. And the website is computermuseumofamerica.org? That's correct. And then your dream of dreams is to be a place from where people are coming from all over the world to come and see this? Absolutely, and to grow it. We have built in uh, an, another 60-plus thousand square feet 
that's directly above our phase one um, for phase two once we get enough public support. And then are we out of stuff that you own or and we got to get other stuff or we've just scratched the surface of your we own collection? Just, just, We're calling collection just an scratch air the surface. <laughs> just, just scratch the surface. Um, the collection actually is much stronger in the micros than what you'll see when you show up at the museum. Mm -hmm. And we want to we want to get those out of storage, although at any moment in time, there'll never be more than maybe one percent of the collection on display. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh putting your your time, energy, and resources into making this happen. I think it's it's important for people to have some context. I think we lose context a lot of times and to see things from the past and the way that it was and not imagine how they were, to actually see it and what that the limitations and challenges that they had. I think that's important for people as they learn. Absolutely. And one more time, it's computermuseumofamerica.org. Thank you, Lonnie and Karen Mims, for making that happen. Thank you so much for having us. And then what can we do to help you? What do you need more of? Uh, money. More money? <laughs> <laughs> more money. So you need, uh, it's a nonprofit, so you need more uh, donors and more supporters and sponsors. But you also need more people to come, uh, once it opens, more people to come and, and take part. Correct. We, we would love to have volunteers um, to be docents mm -hmm. on the weekend. And uh, the faster we have a, uh, can raise the funds, the, the quicker we can get to phase two. And Atlanta uh, badly needs a science technology museum. Mm -hmm. that right now, um, you know, my kids had one when we were growing up. That, that has since closed. Right. And, um, you know, we have two, two wonderful natural history museums, but we don't really have a technology museum for almost 6 million people. Right. That's shame on us. We have to do better. And Truly. we, and we appreciate you for taking action and making it happen. All right. Next up on Atlanta business radio, we've got Thomas Frank and he is with 44. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome. Tell us about 44. How are you serving folks? What's your museum like? Well, we don't have a museum, uh, but uh, without the innovation here on the technology front, we certainly wouldn't be able to do what we currently do, which um, maybe I guess a good way to step back is just to give you guys a good description of what we do. So we're uh, what's called a digital agency, mm -hmm. um, which means that we do everything from developing digital marketing campaigns to uh, complex e-commerce uh, platforms, e-commerce stores, um, large-scale global content management systems. We do analytics, uh, so measuring, uh, you know, the performance of the um, of the things that we build, uh, and then we also um, do a good bit of research uh, to understand our key audiences and to um, uh, potentially reach them or, or serve them better. Um, so our focus has been mostly e-commerce. So we run um, e-commerce for Coca-Cola, so shop uh, Coke's um, online store where you can customize uh, bottles and you can buy merchandise and things of that nature. So, um, uh, so yeah, e-commerce, those are the types of things that we do. So now you're doing the e-commerce from the uh, from Coke's for the consumer, not for their internal like supply chain to help them. That's right. It's all for the consumer. Um, so it's CokeStore.com. You can go... Uh, and as I said, you can, you know, create a, cu a custom bottle, which is interesting because you can literally put your name on a bottle uh, mm -hmm. and then four days later it will show up uh, at your door. Um, but we also sell a bunch of other things for uh, Coke on the store. Um, but, um, yeah, we run the, in uh, the entire infrastructure for that. We run the e-commerce platform. <clears throat> Excuse me. We design and develop, um, you know, all the marketing around it. Um, and that's one of the key e-commerce pieces that we do. Now, what's your background? How'd you get into this line of work? Well, my background is actually more from the creative side. I'm uh, I'm the founder, but also um, one of the managing partners. I have two other partners uh, currently, uh, and I'm on the, um, the the executive creative director. So I, I manage the um, creative team, the user experience team, the design team, content team, folks like that. Um, so my background is actually more from um, a design perspective, um, and I. Spent a good amount of time working at um, a variety of different agencies, but also working with um, folks like IBM Global Services and Cambridge Technology Partners on um, yeah, developing um, 
you know, first uh, websites. Uh, I, I'm not digital native. I may be the, one of the last few people who got <laughs> digital native. Uh, but, uh, but um, you know, doing things when digital was uh, literally doing CD-ROMs or interactive pieces um, and then developing um, some of the first really major websites for um, when I was at IBM. Um, and then just uh, have been in the space for the last – uh, 20 years or so uh, now, and um, at some point here, eight years ago, decided that uh, we could do it a better way uh, and um, wanted to c- create a firm that had some other values and uh, did some other things for clients that we didn't believe were being serviced. Now, when you get involved in e-commerce, what are the um, kind of strategies to help a firm kind of get the most out of it when you kind of were living through the Amazon kind of uh, Amazon kind of centric world sure. where Amazon gets a lot of attention. They do get a lot of attention. Uh, and they deal with a lot of e-commerce. I mean, they're trying to take a lot of – they want to do e-commerce for a lot of firms. Yeah, yeah and they do uh, do a lot of e-commerce for a lot of firms. But, you know, it, I mean, Amazon's great. We, we don't – we and I know I just called it e-commerce, but we're getting to the point where we don't even call it e-commerce anymore. We just call it commerce. So – what we're doing um, with our clients and, and um, with brands is <clears throat> helping them to really think through what their entire channel strategy is. Um, Amazon has to be one of those. Um, I guess it doesn't have to be, but certainly um, we're helping Coke sell Coke products on uh, Amazon. But um, there's got to be a direct-to-consumer model, and for some companies, there's still a, a huge retail piece. Now, the retail piece changes, but... Um, you know, there's still companies that have lots of great uh, brands that have great stores. Um, so we don't just focus on necessarily e-commerce. We really look at the whole omni-channel experience uh, and how consumers want to interact with brands um, and and get products. So although you might, uh, you know, you might get uh, something from Amazon, it's great. But, um, you know, a lot of people still want to go to the store and experience the brand and try things on and all that type of stuff. And Or um, we have a few customers where we're doing – um, which is buy online and, uh, and just pick up at the store. Uh, we've got a uh, large-scale e-commerce operation in the Northeast from a hardware store. It's got about 250 or so uh, stores. And um, what they find is a lot of folks are actually um, ordering things via uh, the app that we built for them um, and picking up on the way home. So you know, the use case around that is, you know, especially in the Northeast, you've got a lot of, um, you know, all of a sudden a snowstorm comes in. And it's like, wow, you've got to get salt or shovels or whatever. And I need it. And you literally check the store, go home, and they have it sitting outside for you and just pick it up and, and, and go home because you need it immediately. And then uh, I don't think people understand that the e-commerce and Amazon and all that stuff is in the news a lot and people talk a lot about it. But the vast majority of these kind of transactions happen in real life, right? They're not happening over an app or a computer. So you have to have this kind of in real life part of this where you're going into a store, into a physical location. I mean, look, there's certainly a tremendous amount of transactions that are happening that are direct to, um, you know, from your app, from your phone to uh, to your front door that don't require a personal interaction or require a store. Uh, but out of all of the transactions, what percent is happening about through kind of an e as opposed to a, I'm going into sure. a store. You, I, to be honest with you, I don't know the latest stat on that. Um, but it, but it's, it's shifting it, substantially. Right, I know it's shifting, but yeah. is it like 10%? Or oh, is no, it, I think it's more around 50%. You maybe. think 50% are happening yeah, digitally? Uh, yes, digitally, yes, for as sure. As opposed to. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you've been, uh, it depends on how you quantify that too. So, for instance, now you can order uh, at Kroger, uh, for instance, and then you can pull up and you know, they bring it out to you. Is that going to the store or is that a digital transaction? You right. know? Or you can go and have it load, then load it up and then you go inside and pick up a couple of things that you may have got to put to, on the right. list. So so I think that is somewhat of the point is that I think the line of the, all that is blurring substantially. And then you think that the future is more and more E and less and less uh, in the store? R, uh, retail. <laughs> re- retail? I mean, look, I don't think retail is dead. I don't believe that i think it's i mean there's a lot of i mean their layoffs are in the news every day sure there's downsizing in a lot of these uh physical locations for sure i think the um i think it's just going to change i think retail becomes something or is becoming something different than it used to be it's not a matter of walking in a store and going up and down aisles anymore um you know we're working with 
someone who looking at what the store of the future is, which is really about ordering online, picking up and having somebody put things in there. But uh, as you walk through the store, it might be much more virtual. Um, hey, there's some more kiosks, things set up. I can get customers. I mean, so I can get the um, associates that work there to pull things from the back. So it really is becoming much more of a hub for things rather than a place to go uh, and browse around. So it's more of a distribution center rather than an experience? Yeah, I think somewhere in the middle of that. Um, and then there's other stores that are, um, you know, Nike has been launching some really great retail presence that are very digital, uh, digital integrated. So, you know, they know who you are, you, um, you walk in and you, um, you know, they understand what type of, um, athlete you might be, what you might be looking for. Um, you know, all those kind of things are, are, uh, new sort of new experiences, right? Um, you don't have to take things off the rack so you can look in the mirror and see what it looks like when you have clothes on you and all that type of stuff is, right. uh, is, is ahead of us. Now, um, so when you're talking with your customers, how do you walk them through this kind of buyer's journey? Because it seems like it's a pretty big disruption of what it used to be, even a few years, sure, from a, a few years ago. Yeah, yeah, uh, it, it is. Um, I, I don't think one size necessarily fits all. Um, you know, we work with a lot of uh, companies that are what's called a pure play. Um, they just uh, do things. Uh, direct to consumer via their website or uh, or an app, uh, but we also work with um, some folks who have a tremendous amount of retail presence but don't necessarily have their own stores, mm-hmm. um, and then some that have stores, retail uh, retail locations as well as um, you know apps as well as you know e commerce sites. So I don't think there's one answer, but generally speaking, we um, I think what makes us somewhat unique is we try to take a very consultative approach to um, what they're doing rather than necessarily um, saying one, uh, you know, one solution fits all. Um, And we walk them through, we're sort of at the intersection of uh, a consultancy and a traditional agency. We don't just do creative stuff. We have about 25 or so um, technologists and developers that use the most modern machines, Mm -hmm. uh, not the old ones from the Mm -hmm. museum. Um, um, so we, you know, we uh, build the uh, the technologies that they need, uh, but we also walk through the business requirements, understand what is, what's necessary, what's needed, where they want to go, um, what functional components do you need, what are the constraints in terms of distribution, um, you know, what is your overarching strategy, and then walk them through a design process um, that leads us to um, a prioritized list of features and functions we might want to go deploy, uh, and then, as I said, we. Um, go into more of um, a build mode. And then after that, we um, essentially run uh, a lot of e-commerce solutions for our clients, which is around optimization and marketing, um, re- researching the analytics and understanding, you know, how do we get more customers to do, um, to check out, to, um, you know, experience things that we want them to experience. And then is that where, like the hard part is to get the vision right and get the design right, but then it becomes it's not a you're never done right this is a kind of a living breathing thing and you're using data in real time to learn that's right how best optimize yep right yeah that's true um we i think over the last in particular over the last couple years um i've been doing this for a long time i said uh, as i mentioned i I uh, was involved with some of the, um, you know, some of the large scale initial, like I built the first Hertz.com that was transactional, uh, Macy's.com, transactional site, things of that nature. And um, it used to be that you walk people through or clients and, uh, you know, who are really a partners at this point um, through a process. And then, um, you you know, you hope for the best and see how it does. Um I think nowadays what we're finding is the need to uh, much more rapidly get to market and put a product out there um, that, um, you know, may or may, I mean, look, we strive to uh, put the best product out there quickly, but um, there is some uh, notion that you can put together an MVP is, um, that, that allows you to um, get a sense of what's happening, what consumers are really doing, how they behave, um, what they like, what they don't like, and then quickly iterate on those things. You know, unlike uh, unlike print, um, we it's not like you print a million pieces and send them uh, and out hope. there, and then hope. there's less hoping, right? Yeah, there, there's, there's no more hope. iterating and For tweaking sure. in, based on real data, not what some smart person in a 
than a boardroom thinks that's is right. the best that's way right. to do this. Yeah, and that's where our analytics team comes in too. We, um, you know, we've got a handful of folks who are constantly looking at data and uh, analyzing um, the data, uh, and I think that's the key piece too. Is um, you know, we have a lot of uh, data that we're, is available to us now, but um, understanding the data and interpreting right. the data is always uh, is always key and. And uh, we believe it's more than data scientists who need to do that. We believe that requires our creative team to do the user experience team to look at things more holistically, um, to quickly iterate and uh, develop a new solution, uh, and then go you know push it live very quickly and see if that optimizes it. We've done little things from you know eliminating one step in a checkout that increased uh, conversion by twenty five percent. Right. Um, and when you're dealing with large scale volumes. Uh, of some of our um, our partners, then you know that that makes a substantial difference in terms of revenue, and which is a shift in the thinking of a lot of agencies where they were going with their gut feeling. There's less gut feeling nowadays, isn't there? Yeah, I, I, I think mean, you so. may need a gut feeling to start, yeah. but once you start getting data, then the data is the data. It's no longer your opinion anymore. That's right, um, and even I think uh, gut feeling to start is um, also really changed a lot. Um, We already have lots of input. Uh, We already have lots of data. Uh, It may be some slightly different shape uh, or form or we can go get that data. Mm -hmm. But um, but I think that uh, nowadays it's it's a very educated and informed decision and hypotheses that we're putting out there on how something is going to uh, we anticipate it's going to work um, and be used. Uh, and then, um, as you said, we go out and measure uh, and make sure that it's, you know, either our hypotheses are being proven true or not. Um, if they're not, then we need to quickly iterate and change and, and optimize. Now, you mentioned that pure play uh, companies are where you do a lot of your work. Do you have an ideal customer or those are the ideal customers? We you know, it's interesting. I don't know if we have an ideal customer. We don't just do e-commerce. We do tons of marketing uh, and, you know, large-scale digital campaigns and integrated campaigns. We also do a uh, fair amount of large-scale content management systems um, that are global where we have to stand up 45 sites for um, a brand that uh, is truly a global brand. So I don't know if we have an, uh, an ideal customer in terms of the type of work that they do. I think for us, an ideal customer – is more about the type of organization it is and if it aligns with our values, if it, uh, if it truly values our uh, partnership, which is, I think, key because you have to have trust. It isn't really us walking away anymore and uh, doing something in a black box and then hoping right. uh, you know, it comes out shiny and new on the other side or, or works really well. I mean, these folks are sophisticated themselves. They understand their uh, business. They understand... Obviously, um, you know what they want to do and their goals and objectives. So, uh, just having a great partnership uh, is is the key, uh, and trust, and and creating a sort of an integrated team. And I, I think agencies in the past have been much more, and I think in some cases still today uh, have been much more inclined to just do you know give us the brief. We'll come back later in, in, in right. several weeks, and you know, ta da! Hopefully, mm-hmm. it's great. And if somebody wanted to learn more, what's the coordinates? coordinates um well you can find us uh, at 44.com um, spelled out yep spelled out not the number um we actually own the uh, misspelled version also so in case because everyone wants to spell that f-o-u-r uh, do they yeah yeah for sure so uh, we own both so 44.com um and then we're down in Inman Park, uh, although we service clients all over the country and all over the globe uh, we're headquartered down in uh, Inman Park but we don't have we don't get to meet walk-ups <laughs> Well, Thomas, thank you so much for sharing your story. Of course. Thanks for having me. All right. Hang with us. One more guest. Next up on Atlanta Business Radio, Sky Estroff, the brains behind the Southern Wing Showdown. Welcome. Thank you. That is quite an introduction (laughs) to follow. So you learned uh, anything today? You got a lot of activities now to do. Yes, you got to work of on activity. the e-commerce. You got to go to the museum. I feel like I just took a course, like in the past <laughs> few minutes. I, there's a lot going on in my brain right now, but I'm fascinated by everybody's mm-hmm. stories. That's for sure. Uh, well, tell us about the Southern Wing Showdown. This is how many years has it been? This is the fourth year. Fourth ha- year. Is this going to be your fourth year attending? Is it? I don't know. Have you I, been every year? I have been every year, and I got to be a judge last year. I don't know if I 
Can... Well, I hate to break it to you, Lee. You got real judges this time? No, this year we're not having judges for Southern Wing. But we because will for Because of something taste. I did last year? No, you did a great job judging. You were our best judge Thank last you. year. I'll That's what I heard. The record. That's what I heard. Uh, but yeah, we, we're not doing judges. We're just doing people's choice. So you still people's get a vote. Choice. All right. And you could still pretend you're a judge. And Thank it'll you. still count. <laughs> I so, appreciate that. <laughs> come on and enjoy right. that. And But everybody who comes to Southern Wing Showdown this year can be a judge and the long form name of our event is Springer Mountain Farm Southern Wing Showdown produced by Taste of Atlanta <laughs> so it's a long it's gotten, one it's gotten, that's gotten a lot bigger yeah a little bit as the event's gotten bigger yes exactly our logo's different now because we have it all incorporated but um, there's a lot of people besides just me who you think is the brains behind this project <laughs> I know that it's, a, it's a big community that puts this on and then is it this, about the same number of restaurants Yes, we're going to have 30 restaurants this year, 15 from Atlanta and 15 from cities around the South. So like Nashville, Knoxville, Savannah, Charleston, all the best food cities and they're driving in. And it's not just like we've talked about this before too, Lee, because we blow your socks off every time you come yeah, to Southern it's, Wing. It's, how many wings does it give people an understanding? There's everybody <laughs> Springer is is not just in name only. No. Right? They're, they're, they have to produce a lot of wings per restaurant yes. in order to pull this off. Yes. And I, how much is that about? I think I, my best guess, I think, is 2,000 wings per restaurant. So 30 restaurants, 2,000 wings. You do the math. There's <laughs> right. a lot of chicken at this <laughs> event. But, um, yeah, so Springer Mountain Farms is the best that's chicken wing you could partner. possibly get so it's perfect to right. um be our partner for this wing and showdown. then the restaurants aren't just wing restaurants this no. is the beauty of this because uh, there's been like italian food restaurant there's been all kinds of weird restaurants that go i got a wing <laughs> recipe that i'm gonna throw in this thing yep. and see if i can win yeah they're all so weird right they're the weirdest no they're all the best restaurants in the but south but it's not just like, a wing place yes. this is not 30 not wing a, no, restaurants there's no like designated wing place they're all really fabulous restaurant like last year the winner was canoe so that's a really right, like really who would guess that who would guess in? that they know how to make wing? i mean we obviously they know that, they know how to make not a wing, their go-to but it's when not you're their going specialty to canoe. and this one was really good i don't know if you remember it, it had some coconut in it yep. it was it was a great and i wing remember bag. a few years yeah. back there was an indian restaurant yes bojonic oh such a great wing that's in um buckhead Lots of flavor, had a little sweetness to cancel right. out the spicy. I, you really get it all. But and, you wouldn't, going to this event, you're not thinking, oh, I know what I'm going to expect because it'll be wings because I've had wings right. at a wing restaurant. This totally. is not that kind of an event. And a lot of these restaurants don't have the wings that they're serving on their menu. Right. So even if you go visit their restaurant, mm -hmm. if you go to Canoe, I don't think they added that wing to their menu, even though they should have as their Springer Mountain Farm Southern Wing Showdown produced by Taste of Atlanta winning mm -hmm. wing. Exactly. But um, I think that for the most part, this is like an exclusive one day taste the best wings of your life from the best restaurants in the South. And it's bottomless, it, like in terms of drink and food. So you can it's, go in. It's one price. It's everything. not like you got to buy tickets and no. per wing. We don't want to slow you down. No, you no. want to eat fast. It's get a volume. as many wings it's in as volume. possible. Yeah. And it's about 2,000 wings per restaurant. Correct. And when they're out, they're out. The well, showdown ends? they really don't <laughs> run out because 2,000 wings a per restaurant yeah. is a lot of wings. And um, we cut off our attendance at about 1,800 attendees. So we allocate. We have some really complex There's a, algorithm. You use a, a super computer for, for Yeah, this, we right? use <laughs> all of that to get down what's the average person eating and how many wings do we need to supply and which restaurants. So I don't know that formula offhand. It's an it, algorithm. It was in the you just have to say it's, it's a program. <laughs> I mean, it's so it's so back. In, yeah. But um, so we make sure that everybody's fed and any of the food that's left over, we make sure is also put to good use. And we partner with Second Helpings Atlanta and they do all of our food recovery so that the food doesn't go to waste. And that's part of the deal in, in all your events, right? Yes. Yes. They partner with all of our events. Um, sometimes like our last event that you just attended to Food That Rocks in Sandy Springs. Um, was there anything left? There was like not a lot left. There was like 20 pounds of food maybe. <laughs> Right. Like it was, it was not uh, normal. People were very hungry that night. Yes. Yes. 
So now, uh, what's the funnest part for you for putting on this event as opposed to the other Taste of Atlanta events? I think this event is just a ton of fun. It's really casual. It's laid back. I like the venue, which is the Fairmont in West Midtown. Um, the restaurants really bring it. It's a nice day out. It's a Sunday from 1 to 5 p.m., so it's really just a good time to get away. Also, our event is indoors and air-conditioned. Exactly. So I don't have to worry about weather and all of that good stuff because at our other events, that's definitely a point of um, focus before we lead up to the event. So um, you know that you have a roof over your head and you have air conditioning and there's a ton of wings to eat. And then when you go there, it's kind of a cool sight to see because all yes. of the restaurants are, they're not inside. A lot of them no. are outside in tents. Oh, for sure. <laughs> and they all have, there's like a chef camaraderie. A lot right. of these chefs, they're they're the best chefs in Atlanta and in the South. Like I keep saying, um, they don't always get to hang out with each other because they're back of house in a kitchen cooking up other dishes that aren't wings or right. sometimes the specialty wing. Um, so it's really nice for them to hang out with each other and be a part of the people that are like loving their food. A lot of times um, chefs are back in the kitchen. They can't even see the reactions of the people that are eating their food. And it's really awesome for them to see that they're like making somebody happy that day or making somebody like say wow out loud and just get excited about the food that they're creating. And again, it's not a only hot wings. There's probably going to be some hot wings, but this is a really a chance for them to be creative on, yes. on a on a piece of meat that is kind of people take for granted. And there's people doing a lot of creative things. I think creativity might have been one of the categories I on the judging so. forum last year. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we make sure. It's just... I don't think there was one buffalo wing last year or right. the year before. It's all like very creative takes. It can be based on what they're doing in the restaurant, like Bojanic when they do, I don't even remember the actual title of the wing, but it's just that kind of sweet and spicy mix of a wing. Um, and like canoe with the coconut wing and other flavors like Chibo Ibeve wasn't there last year, but two years ago they had this wing that was coated with some Parmesan crumbs and basil and like a basil aioli and a little bit of tomato that was a fabulous wing. They're coming back this year, so I'm excited to try theirs too. And then um, how do you kind of find these ones that are out of the city? Are they coming to you now at this point? I mean, everybody wants to win. Let's just <laughs> put it that way. It is a fierce competition. They want to hang out with all the chefs, but Springer Mountain Farms really helps curate that list, uh -huh. and uh, they just have great relationships with some of the best restaurants in the South and bring them all in. And then so there, it's being represented, you said half of them are from the metro area or Atlanta yes. area. And then the other 15 are from Nashville. Surrounding cities, yes. So where, what are those cities represented? Nashville, Knoxville, Charleston, Savannah, Franklin, Tennessee, um, Birmingham, Chattanooga. That might be all of them. Mm -hmm. And then Atlanta. And I'm grouping Atlanta like Marietta, all the right. other parts and it's pockets not just of downtown, Atlanta. It's not right. just like... Yeah, it's not downtown. And then I don't uh, think there is a downtown restaurant anymore. actually. That's but, it. But there's Midtown, yeah. and there's yeah. like all the other restaurants. But. So now, um, when is the day of this event? It is Sunday, August twenty fifth, from one to five p.m. So everybody, mark that in your calendars. Mm -hmm. It's a day. It's before football season. You're not no busy. excuses. Um, it, there's no mm -hmm. excuse. Like it's just it's going to be too hot to be outside. So just come eat wings. Right, and then um, this sells out. So this is yes. a, you got to get. Uh, your tickets early. Is there any incentive for getting early or is there? Yeah. Uh, door pricing is increased. So mm -hmm. you don't want to buy at the door because, and also you don't want to get to the door and there's no tickets left. And that's a really sad sight to see when right. we have to turn people Especially away. Especially because you can smell it from yeah. outside. Because <laughs> the fun thing about, and the funny thing about our events is that um, the fire marshals always show up because they yeah, just, they, do. they, Everybody they wants want that. to come <laughs> eat and have an excuse to be around that good smelling food. So, so uh, we really do have to cut off at a certain <laughs> point. So you do need to buy your ticket early and you do save money doing so. Now, uh, was it at the Fairmont last year? Or was it yes. Or was it the Fairmont last year? So parking was okay. But, yeah. And but Uber, are you partnering with Uber any of the rides here? Lyft. Lyft Very is nice. our partner this year. And we will be providing a 20% off your ride code. And it's a really special program, actually. And it's a pilot program that we're producing with Lyft that... 
not only will you get 20% off your ride to the event, but Lyft will in turn donate to Second Helpings Atlanta in order to supply meals um, for people. So it's really a cool program that you're not only getting a little benefit for you, but you're supporting a nonprofit as well. So now um, in terms of the food festivals in Atlanta, Taste of Atlanta does what? how many altogether? Three, four? Three. Yes. So Food That Rocks in Sandy Springs that we just had in June mm-hmm. in the City Springs area. And then Southern Wing Showdown, Sunday, August 25th, 1 to 5 p.m. Everybody's got to be there. And then Taste of Atlanta is in Fourth Ward Park across from Pont City Market. And that will be October 18th, 19th, and 20th this year. And then that, again, was that was where it was last year. And you take over yes. the whole park area and it's the really beautiful. Park. It's adjacent to the Beltline. Yes, you can get there from the Beltline. We have a Beltline entrance, everything. Right. And then, again, Southern Wing Showdown, is there a website where you can see kind of the restaurants that are in there? Absolutely. Go stalk all the restaurants and our sponsors and all of that good stuff. Go to southernwingshowdown.com for all of that great information. Well, Sky, thank you so much for sharing your story. And this is a great event. If you like wings and want to see the best chefs uh, um, be creative on a wing, that's the place to go. Absolutely. We hope to see you there. All right. This is Lee Cantor for Sanjay Touré. We will see you all next time on Atlanta Business Radio. (laughs)